friends, I'm sorry I haven't a clue. The antidote to panel go. And the piano is Dave Lee and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Thank you very much. And the eager participants in this contest are, on the one hand, Tim Brooke Taylor and William Rushton. <laughs> and they'll be competing against Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. <laughs> My job is to keep the score or give points or something. So here we go with round one, which is our game called Sound Charades. One team has to make noises and the other team must guess what they mean. <laughs> the audience are let into the secret by way of a, of a board, which we show them in here. And incidentally, those of you at home will hear a disembodied voice giving you the answer. And you in the audience here in the studio can help by applauding when they're getting warmer and doing whatever you think comes naturally when they're not. <laughs> Tim and Willie, yours is the first charade, so while you tell um, Graham and Barry how many words it is, uh, it'll be shown to our audience on a board. And Tim and Willie's charade is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. It's three words, one of very little consequence. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't fool me for an Too enormous importance. <laughs> It's, it's a film, it's also something else, but we're not going to tell you what that is, because they might give it away. Dance up. Sit, beg, you wretch, put that postman down. Eat your giblets, come, go, die for queen. <laughs> I don't believe that last one either. Die for the queen, the royal command. Perilously. <laughs> That wasn't it, but uh, the audience thinks you're somewhere near. Something command. That's what we meant. Oh, you meant ten commandments. <laughs> so you can tell Barry out there, you know. Once again, the uh, man with the board is coming round to show you, and the man with the voice is going to tell you at home what this one is. Barry and Graham Sherrard is Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> Barry and Graham, how many words? Three words. Right. Do your Sherrard. What is it? A book. A book. Mm -hmm. Here it comes. Look at all those lions over there. I am very sorry, but I just can't stand lions. <laughs> Daniel? No. <laughs> lions is helpful, is it? I mean, lions... Enormously. Not, they yeah. a lot. <laughs> it's the Marquis of Bath. Uh, well, Willie, I think you've got this one, haven't you? <laughs> <coughs> I don't think I remember it now. No. Um, Leo... The lions. It's not a pun on the word lions, is it? It's just no. lions are in it. Pride. Pride and Prejudice. Oh. <laughs> right, well, Tim and Willie have got three and a half for that round, and Barry and Graham have got three. And at this point, which seems like halfway through the programme, <laughs> is where I introduce a round that's played at the end of the programme in order to give the teams time now to think of silly names for people arriving at the Booksellers Ball. The Booksellers Ball. Right, and now we go on to a new round, and this one should be uh, uh, culturally uh, elevating. It's a musical round, and I want you uh, to sing in teams, this is two, two at a time, a snatch of grand opera from a selected libretto, <laughs> libretto which I shall give you. We're going to start with Barry and Graham. Barry and Graham, your extract comes from Mrs. Beaton's Cookery and Household Management. <laughs> The section devoted to braised sheep's tongues. <laughs> Dave Lee will give you the introduction, and if you'll uh, 
Give us uh, your operatic version. Thank you, Humphrey. And by the way, I think you're doing a marvellous job as chairman of this programme. <laughs> fitting lid and dust for ten minutes over a very low heat. Pass for ten minutes. Pass for ten minutes. Pass for ten minutes. for ten minutes. For ten minutes. Ten minutes. Lay the tongues on top. Peppercorns and enough stock almost to cover the vegetables. <laughs> Place the bacon on top of the tongue. Cover with grease, grease, food, paper and the lid. And cook gently for about two Thank you, Barry, for your opening remarks there. You get ten marks for that. <laughs> now then, Tim and Willie, yours comes from not Mrs. Beaton this time, but from Miss Blyton. <laughs> and the chapter of concern is headed, Where is Big Ears? <laughs> right, Dave Lee once again with the introduction. <laughs> What's happened? Hello. Hello. <laughs> no, I'm not much hurt. I fell off my bicycle when it went over the big stone. I'm afraid it's got a bit damaged. I'm looking for my poor old pussy. <laughs> Partly for sheer musicianship, <laughs> and partly because you didn't preface that performance with smarmy remarks to the chairman, I'm going to give you 15. <laughs> 15? <laughs> but I, well, and we go on hurriedly to the round which is called Bedtime Story. And for this round, I want one of the members of a team to make up a bedtime story. From time to time, he'll give his partner a signal for a suitable sound effect to reinforce the dramatic effect of the narrative. For extra excitement, the person doing the effects will be wearing headphones with music playing so as to prevent him from hearing the story. I shall give uh, you, Tim and Willie, a, a, a theme for your story. Tim, I understand you're coming out front to work the uh, yes. sound effects, and Willie will be telling the story and cueing you for those effects. <laughs> Willie, I want your story to involve a grandmother, a kangaroo, and a hovercraft. <laughs> 
One fine day, Granny, a failed kleptomaniac, <laughs> contemplated escaping from her tiny little woodland home because the fuzz were hot on her heels. She could hear them coming. <laughs> Spanish policeman. <laughs> But then Granny was very old and very wise, been gun running for years between Tangiers <laughs> and Alcatraz or whatever that place is on the south coast. In fact, you could hear her gun running. Evening, oh. <laughs> the Spanish are forced every now and then to recruit British officers. She decided that she must get back to her old home and beauty in England. She could almost hear the peace of her little cottage in Hertfordshire. <laughs> the most virile cuckoos in the world. <laughs> About. But how was she to get there? Hovercraft, she thought. <laughs> Alas, she saw the hovercraft coming across the Mediterranean towards her, and she heard this dismal sound. <laughs> Not for me, she thought. <laughs> and started looking around for some alternative method of transport. Well, by some strange meeting between a camel and um, some form of leaping beast whose name I forget, but who had mated these delightful strains, give us a delightful strain. <laughs> I know, it, was a, it was a camel and a praying mantis. They had to use a kangaroo. So Granny slipped into the pocket. And in her little kangaroo, she set off home. Just like that. <laughs> well, from the audience reaction, I give you eight out of ten for that. And we go over now to Barry and Graham. Barry, you're doing the sound yeah. effects. Graham, you're doing the story, which uh, has to involve Rupert Bear, mm. a death ray, and a banana. <laughs> It was a bright, sunny day when Rupert Bear visited his uncle's farmyard. There was Rover, the old sheepdog, and over there, Clarence the, <laughs> Clarence the hen with a cough. <laughs> and other problems. Good morning, Clarence. Good morning, Clarence, cried Rupert. And Clarence replied, Shut that door. <laughs> Bearing out some of the problems I mentioned earlier. Bearing out. <laughs> Rupert had come to see his uncle's death ray. <laughs> and why not? But as he walked across the farmyard, he could see Daisy the cow in the meadow. Mm, said Daisy. And up in the hill, he could hear the sheep bleating. <laughs> and down in the valleys, the artichokes, down in the valleys, the artichokes were going cheek, 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 cheek. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, back in the farmhouse, Rupert's uncle leaned out of the window and shouted, Nice to see you, to see you, nice. <laughs> Good morning, Uncle Eamon, cried Rupert. <laughs> I've come to see a death ray. Have a banana. Thank you very much. <laughs> and why not? Rupert's uncle peeled the banana, which made a curious noise, rather like this. <whistles> How strange, <laughs> thought Rupert, but said nothing of it at the time. Wishing only to see the death ray. It's in this cupboard, said his uncle, and opened the door. <laughs> Three times. Four times. <laughs> Rupert was amazed by what he saw before him. An enormous machine with whirling dials and flashing lights. And enormous electric sparks that leapt and crackled and went... Ooh. <laughs> Never had he seen such gay sparks. <laughs> he 
Let me switch it on for you, said Rupert's uncle. What, said Rupert? Oh, I see. <laughs> so saying, his uncle threw a switch. <laughs> straight through the window. <laughs> Where am I, said Rupert. And I agreed with him. <laughs> For he had been standing in the path of the death ray, and the last thing that Rupert said before he disintegrated in a small pile of dust was... At the third stroke, <laughs> it will be four precisely. <laughs> Thank you, Graham and Barry. Well, following on an objection from the other side, I've had to take off six marks for cheating, but I've given you eight for getting away with it, so that brings you to <laughs> 13 and a half, and it brings the scores level to 26 and a half each. Uh -huh. uh, we have the, the game now, which is called Adlib Poem. The team's going to make up a poem. Each team member must keep going until I, I press the bell, which I have here, which sounds like this, as you haven't heard it before. Ah. And then a member of the opposing team must take over. This goes on until the natural artistic conclusion is reached, or until none of us can stand it anymore. <laughs> now, Barry, you're going to start the poem, and uh, I think this is in your line, so uh, are you ready to start off now? Your opening line is, as Sidebottom and Murgatroyd, the duo toured the halls. <laughs> Sidebottom and Murgatroyd, the duo toured the halls. A great success in every town. They took calls after calls. Upon the stage they strutted and fret. Their hour in light so bright. But Unfortunately, an incident occurred one starlit night. When they were on the stage of the old Alhambra Bogner. Oh, you're in trouble. Go on, son. <laughs> Bob! <Bogner. laughs> they travelled light. They had no trunks. They had neither cat nor dog nor any sort of pet with them. Upon that fateful tour, unfortunately, they were very, very, very poor. <laughs> so poor, in fact, that every night when they got home to bed... They took their little legs off. <laughs> and then unscrewed a head. <laughs> I don't think I've mentioned before. In fact, I know that it is true. It was a ventriloquist act, and it was a little blue. <laughs> By blue, I don't mean dirty, I mean the colour, so. <laughs> Aren't you going to ring the bell? <laughs> I had a ribbon in my hair, I tied it in a bow. What this has to do with poem, I am not too sure. Barry. But at least you might say it's not clean, but at least it's very pure. Returning to Murgatroyd and Sidebottom, the tale we have to tell. One week, they turned up there in ghoul. <laughs> the ventriloquist dummy said, I'm sick of being a fool. My father was a sailor, and my mother was a cupboard. <laughs> I think I've sunk myself. Mother, yes, I go. Mother Hubbard. Back to Mother Hubbard. <coughs> Mother bored me night by night with tales of Mother Hubbard, which weren't very tasteful when you think what Wood has done. <laughs> but be that as it may. <coughs> oh, well. I nearly had a son. But then one night... <laughs> one dark and dreary night, it was full of dread. My legs fell off <laughs> and rolled away right underneath the bed. M Murgatroyd came up the stairs. He'd got back from the pub. <laughs> He'd taken his other leg off and used it as a club. <laughs> Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to wait for an artistic conclusion. Any oh, conclusion right. is welcome after that one. And we go on now to the blues. 
uh, in which uh, one side gives the other side a, a topic for the blues, and the other side has to sing it with, of course, appropriate accompaniment from Dave Lee at the piano. Barry and Graham, will you give Willie and Tim a topic for the blues, please? Um, yes, we thought the package holiday blues. Package holiday blues. Did you? Dave, do the introduction. to begin. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 man. Yeah, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'll sing it again. They said, they said, it's 45 pounds and you won't have to spend a penny extra on anything. <laughs> Believe me, after 15 days at Gatwick, with nowhere to spend a penny, believe me, I was really all in. <laughs> oh, yeah, you better believe it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Right, from audience reaction, six marks for that, and we go on with, uh, for, with Willie and Tim giving uh, Barry and Graham a topic for their blues. What is it? The Danish blues. <laughs> <laughs> Prince of Denmark, and I got those Danish blues. Yes, very clever that. Eight marks, and uh, you'd like to know the scores, I've no doubt. Now we come to the. Uh... <laughs> We come to the point in the program where I take a back seat uh, so that I can uh, listen to all those announcements which uh, you've been thinking up throughout the program for the arrivals at the booksellers' ball. Who's going to open the bidding? Mr. and Mrs. Furt Book Fair. <laughs> <laughs> and their son, Frank Furt Book Fair. <laughs> One for the cognoscenti. Adjust your raiment, pray. <laughs> For Monsieur and Madame Impia Press and a disgusting froggy child, Oli Impia Press. <laughs> <laughs> Sliding by almost unnoticed. <laughs> oh no, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Chenery and their diminutive student son, shorter Oxford Dick Chenery. <laughs> Please be extremely kind and welcoming to Mr. and Mrs. Zine and their disgusting daughter, Margaret, known as Dirty Magazine. Uh, it's come a long way. Raptures of delight, if you will, for Mr. and Mrs. Scabbin and their uncle, Tom Scabbin. Here on a day trip from France, they caught a packet of Boulogne, but they keep smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Two Cities and their marauding barbaric son, Attila Two Cities. <laughs> a face, unfortunately, not to be seen in our midst tonight. <laughs> Mr. Baggers and his carp. Unfortunately, the carp at baggers. <laughs> class. Class, be honest. Class, Will class. you prepare to hurl yourselves around with mirth? <laughs> <laughs> at the arrival of Mr. and Mrs. Sorites. 
and their dipsomaniac daughter, Alicia, known as Pub Alicia Sorites. <laughs> Touch the hems of several garments <laughs> for the entry of Mr. and Mrs. Copedia and their naval son, Ensign Copedia. <laughs> Cock an eyebrow. <laughs> for Mr. and Mrs. Jonathan Cape and their son, the great S. Cape. <laughs> <laughs> but at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you that uh, Tim and Willie have scored 51 and Barry and Graham uh, 52. Right. And this pretty well brings us up now to the end of the... Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> Ding Library. <laughs> and her son, Len. Len. Ding Library. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. closely following. Mr. and Mrs. Tents Page. And their son, Con Tents Page. <laughs> and who's that with them, Mr. and Mrs. Tease Falcon and their daughter, Moll? <laughs> Tersellers and their daughter, Best Sellers. <laughs> <laughs> who's just had her appendix removed. <laughs> Oh, look, there's the flats with their daughter Pam. Sorry, hum. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that entirely reverses the score, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. It does bring finally, us... snap your garters with ribald mirth. <laughs> <laughs> For the entrance, all the way from France, of Mr. and Mrs. Miserable and their son Les. <laughs> And that reverses the score once again and means that we've come now to the end of the programme. We shall see you again next week. Until then, goodbye now. <laughs> William Rushton, Graham Garden, Barry Cryer and Tim Brooke Taylor were being given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Dave Lee setting some of them to music. Production was by John Castles. <laughs> We present, I'm sorry, I haven't a clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Leon Cohen, and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Those taking part are Tim Brooke Taylor and William Rushton. And they'll be issuing a number of unlikely challenges to Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. And I'm in the chair because there's no room on the table. The first round is called... <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, in order to get the game off to a turgid start, we have a round called Sound Charades. One team has to make noises and the other team has guessed what they mean. The audience are let into the secret and can help by applauding when they're getting warmer. On the other hand, they can help even more by shutting up. Now, <laughs> the first people to make the noises are Tim Brooke Taylor and Willie Rushton. And uh, there'll be a pause now while somebody shows the audience what... Uh, this charade is, and a voice will tell those of you. Who are... <laughs> and Tim and Willie's charade is a walk in the black forest. A walk in the black forest. Tim, Tim and Willie. Now, what is that? Is this a? a, a it's book obviously or... something different than we thought it was. <laughs> It's, um, it's a piece of music. piece of music. Okay, yeah. does that satisfy you, Barry and Graham? You've got the answer straight away, have you? We'd like them to make their noises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the noises first. Yes. Are you do no, how do many yes. uh, parts are you doing it in? Uh, we're doing it all together. One. All together. All together. Uh, do you want to know how many words there are on the... Yes. Damn. <laughs> 
six. <laughs> but okay. some are unimportant. Yeah. You settled six. Okay, it's all six. going. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Well, it's a, it's a lovely day, isn't it? Let's step out a bit. Yes, I listen to the birds tweeting. Mm. Tweet, tweet! Mm. Oh, and just listen to the, the trees whispering. It's a fine thing. <laughs> Graham, I want you to be very careful. Barry's got it. Little of what you fancy does you good is too. No, too many letters. Um, it must be a walk in the uh, coloured forest. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, there's a lukewarm uh, hint. Uh, a walk in the, the immigrant forest. <laughs> In the memory, emergent <laughs> nations forest. No, we're getting to it. Getting to it. It's probably a walk in the black forest, isn't it? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> you scored two points for that because it says that I've got to give you two points to here. And uh, Barry and Graham, it's your turn to make the noises, and Tim and Willie, it's your turn to guess what they represent. Once again, the audience will be shown. Barry and Graham Sherrard is Anthony Wedgwood Ben. Anthony Wedgwood Ben. Barry and Graham, is this a, a, a work of fiction or what? Uh, there are two theories on this. Uh, uh, no, it's not a work of fiction. It, it's a work of fact. A work of God of fact. It, <laughs> it's a person. It's a person. A person, right, that gives you, uh, that narrows it down a bit. <laughs> for you. How many letters? Uh, words. Three words. Three words. And we'll do them one by one in the right order. <laughs> right, start now. Starting with Graham. Knees! Don't talk to me about knees. Can't stand knees. Knees are out. Oh! Part two. <laughs> Uh, what's that under your bed? Oh, that's, uh, Good Lord, that must be worth a fortune. Certainly is. <laughs> and, uh, and incidentally, get out of my bed. <laughs> I just said that for effect. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Alan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> Edgar Poe. Edgar Poe. Yes. 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 Knees Jerry Ben. Knees Jerry Ben. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, uh, Anthony Wedgwood Ben, I dare say. Uh, uh. Can you explain how you arrived at that conclusion? <laughs> I don't know, he's a worker. Barry and Graham, I'm only going to give you one mark for that, because they took longer to guess it, but you took longer to do it. Oh. <laughs> this is where I introduce a round that's played at the end of the programme. I want to give the teams time to think through the programme of silly names for people arriving at the publican's ball. The publican's ball. Oh, so oh. start thinking teams, because <laughs> you won't need to think in any of these other rounds. Uh, <laughs> This one's the blues, familiar round to all our listener. <laughs> and, um, we have Leon Hello, Turner piano to provide the uh, accompaniment to this. Each team will give the other team the topic for a blues, which they must then improvise. And uh, Barry and Graham will give a topic, please, to Tim and Willie. Uh, we'd like to give you the uh, private army blues. <laughs> Men. Ah. Look, 
Britain great again. Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> Plan of action for today. Uh, One. Ah, uh, we're going to stick a bayonet right up Anthony Wedgwood. <laughs> Nothing personal, okay, Tony. Very good. Uh, or oh, you might notice this coming. Tim and Willie, will you give a topic now to Barry and Graham? Uh, sugar rationing. Oh. Very sugar. Yes, Barry and Graham, congratulations, that puts you just in the lead. <laughs> we go on to uh, a round which is called New Words. For the simple reason this is a new round which we haven't oh, played before. And for this round I'm going to give each of you a word which you must then use in a sentence to demonstrate its meaning. The members of the opposing team can challenge if they disagree and give the real meaning if they can. And marks will be awarded only if I remember to write them down. Barry, <laughs> let's start with you. And your word is burl, B-I-R-L-E. My wife said she'd always loved Ives. I thought she meant saint, but found she meant burl. <laughs> Ingenious. <laughs> well, I'm told he enjoys being a burl. <laughs> <laughs> no, to burl means to carouse. Oh, it's a verb? Yes. Ah. Yes. You didn't want me to tell you that, did you? No, no, no. no it makes no, it more no. fun if I don't. What's a verb? Right. Now then, Willie, your word is blad, B-L-A-D. And as uh, we didn't the tell... The first Chinese Western was Glad Day at Brack Rock. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brack Rock, actually, to be totally accurate. Don't be totally Very accurate. Close to it, actually. Well, actually, I'll tell you the meaning. It means to step heavily, to blad. As you knew. But As I suggested. At Brack Rock. Graham, it's your word now. Engrail. E-N-G-R-A-I-L. Engrail. It's, it's right. North Country dialect. Well, can you give us a sentence? Uh, which is an illusion of the words and great sort of thing, as if you were saying and great Britain. Um, as in Eddie Waring. No. <laughs> Well, fair face is the word for that, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Timmy Willie, any improvements on that? You no, mean? I can't do any wearing at all, can you? No, <laughs> 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 no can you wearing? Like to do yeah. something else. No, but we could improve on him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'd, I'd have thought that was correct. Well, actually, <laughs> engrail, I'll tell you what it means, it means to render prickly. To render prickly. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and Tim, your word, and, I, and if you write this one down, because it, it's a bit complicated. Mm -hmm. Za. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's me hay fever. Zaptie. Z a p t i e h. He sank to his knees, shouting, "My zaptiers are frozen." <laughs> but the, on the other hand. Uh, <laughs> Elaborating, I mean, I'd, uh, can you elaborate on that a bit? I mean, it's meaning a zaptier is a what? It's a sort of... Uh, <laughs> Go on, sort of basket you play... Uh, you We're not play, having any double play meaning play zaptiola with. <laughs> no, that's a blab. It's a sort of zaptier. ta <laughs> zaptier. You're getting closer all the time. Uh, zap t a t a Good night. I know that. <laughs> Very I, I know it, for you see, I know it, because it's, it's Czechoslovakian for shooting stick. 
I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm declaring my interest in this. I do know that it is a Czechoslovakian shooting stick. Well, it's on a matter peak in a way because you ram it into the ground and then sit on it, and it's a sort of zap. T. Hey! <laughs> Notorious for inserting them in the ground the wrong way round, you see. Actually, get the point in the I end. Yeah. To... <laughs> I'm going to give you ten points for that, Barry, because you're so close. You're only you're only a few hundred miles uh, out on that one. It's a Turkish policeman. <laughs> right. But now we go on to the next round. Incidentally, people write into this program and complain that. Uh, They've added up the score with me, and they find that my addition is wrong, and uh, and they complain that I'm cheating and not keeping the right score. I'd like to say that I find that incredible. Uh, this round is called it's a musical round. This one. The musical round is called opera, and I want you to sing a snatch of grand opera, or indeed any other kind of opera, from a selected passage. And we're going to start this time with Barry and Graham. Barry and Graham, we want you to uh, sing a passage from the Stock Market Report. The pace of yesterday's advance in London stock markets proved too hot to be maintained today, and generally irregular conditions develop after a firm opening. Associated Portland Cement advanced eight pence to four hundred and thirty four. Tower of Construction, however, were depressed by their interim report <laughs> and fell down in half. Many engineering shares yes. made further progress. With Alfred Herbert again higher. Alfred Herbert again higher. In the coming year, raised Alfred Herbert. <laughs> No wonder, no wonder shares are going through the floor. Anyway, Barry and Graham, very, very good. Tim and Willie, your uh, libretto is from the shipping forecast. I would like, would like to say to anybody out on the ocean who is listening to this, this is only a game. And, uh, <laughs> and this is taken from a shipping forecast of several years ago. <laughs> Here is the shipping forecast issued by the Meteorological Office at 1710 British Summertime. Then <laughs> move slowly east across Western and Northern Sea. I forget the rest of the journey. <laughs> and now the area forecasts for the next 24 hours. Southwesterly for increasing seeks <laughs> with the fog patches rain at times later. <laughs> Irish Sea Irish Sea Yes <laughs> Shortly three increased in five or six beer in <laughs> Fair Isle. Oh. Pharaohs. Oh, Pharaohs. <laughs> For the late five increasing six. No icing. Locally poor. Rock all. Oh, thank you very much. Well, if you've tuned in in the middle of this program, you must be absolutely <laughs> flabbergasted. <laughs> that brings the score to Tim and Willie, 82, Barry and Graham, 28. <laughs> and we come to uh, an ever-popular round, which is the ad-lib poem. The team Except is going to make... with us. <laughs> <laughs> the team, you know you love it. The teams are going to make up a poem. Each team member must keep going until I press the buzzer, which sounds like... 
that. It's a good buzzer, I must say. <laughs> And then a <laughs> They've switched it on me. Then a member of the opposing team must take over. This goes on until the natural artistic conclusion is reached, or until I find my buzzer. <laughs> the first line of your poem is this. Now, will you take it down? Give overdue, oh, please leave off. You're going to drive me crackers. <laughs> Oh, Tim Brooke Taylor to start. Oh, good, good. Excellent. I shall be awarding the marks for poetic feeling and sensitivity and a complete <laughs> total absence of rude words. <laughs> Give over to please leave, uh, please leave off. You're going to drive me crackers. I'd like to say another thing. More interesting, I'm sure. I wish you would. <laughs> Will you take up on that, Barry? That though I may be honest, sir, at heart, I know I'm poor. But gold and riches, what are they? <laughs> and money in your purse. As I go through life's pageant, I know it might get worse, and yet a smile is in my heart. Cos pennies aren't all that. I've seen them. <laughs> and pennies sensitive about it, but still I dock my hat <laughs> to them who say, <laughs> to them who say, oh away with gold, it's what's in your heart that counts. <laughs> <laughs> Willie. As long as someone gives you gold in very large amounts. <laughs> I must admit, I hate to say, my financial acumen is not entirely sound. I could say that again. <laughs> my financial acumen is not entirely sound. It's not. And once more, I'll repeat. The soundness of my acumen, finance-wise, leaves a lot to be meat. I should have said, as you will note, met there instead of meat. But I've got a mouthful of dripping hot wet peat. <laughs> now Pete, now Pete was none too happy <laughs> about this situation. <laughs> Steady was a kindly lad and said, without irritation, Nay, nay, I'll tell Nay, 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 nay. I'll say it yet again. Nay, 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 nay. She said, let's get to the point. Enough of all this prevarication. The meat is gone. <laughs> Prevarication. Prevarication, yes, he did indeed. The meat is gone. I'll take the train, in spite of the electrification. <laughs> For they've electrified the line. The coach and carriages too. And if you step inside one, you'll quite soon reach Waterloo. <laughs> Not Waterloo, <laughs> I cried at once. My hand, it smoked my brow. <laughs> I thought that was where Wellington <laughs> stood on the golden prow. Twas Nelson on the prow, I cried, because I'm a learned lad. <laughs> I've had an education. I've learnt what what is what and, and that and, and had. <laughs> I asked this surly youth, what do you mean, young fella? He said, I'll tell you now, sir. <laughs> and to you, madam, to me, I will tell her. What I did mean earlier on, when, when Tim was striving for a rhyme, was I could give him one, you see, but I didn't have the time. <laughs> I could have had the time. I could have had the stature. If only as a lad I'd chanced upon Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> Well, 
I know of no better artistic conclusion than Mrs. Thatcher, so we go on now to the round where I have a well-deserved kit while the teams give their announcements for the late arrivals at the publican's ball. And anybody can start who likes to. Striding through the door, and not a moment too soon, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Tonic and their lovely daughter, Jean Ann Tonic. <laughs> Please welcome, from London, the Bitter family. That's half a bitter. <laughs> <laughs> and his meek daughter, mild and bitter. <laughs> Admire their boldness. <laughs> Camp Barry and his caustic friend, Dry Ginger. <laughs> and a warm welcome, please, all the way from sunny Italy. The Teeny family, Mr. and Mrs. Teeny, and their lovable mother, Sweet Martini. <laughs> all the way from Scotland now, two very close friends, known to their intimates as the Gay Gardens, but known to us. <laughs> Angus Durabitters, <laughs> his very close friend, Hui Dram. <laughs> and also from the heather-clad highlands, oh, welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Twisky. <laughs> and their lovely daughter, Moll Twisky. <laughs> And while you're at it, <laughs> yes, the Port family, Tony Port, <laughs> and his wonderful elderly sister, fine old Ruby. <laughs> Jack Daniels and his wife, Cherry B.B. Daniels. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Atik and their son, Titus Atik. <laughs> there was another version, but we think of the lovable nuts we meet in pubs all over the land. Will you welcome, all the way from Italy, Signor and Signora Ascio. And Frank and son, Giovanni. <laughs> Not to mention <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Ral Water and their daughter Minnie Ral Water. <laughs> and from Greece, O. Who's O? Correct. <laughs> oh. Those enthusiastic clairvoyants, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Dreichery and their medium Dreichery. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> Rush in the doorway there. But in the lead from Sweden, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Tortoise, please. And their son, Lars. Tortoise, please. <laughs> and Bloody Mary. Three soft drinks only. Because the other stuff's being held with the flock wallpaper. <laughs> Dan, Dan Delan and his bird, Ock. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings the score. That brings From the Belle Paris. Oh, hey, welcome. Michel. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. 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 Michel and Madame En Rouge. And their son educated in Scotland, Mac En Rouge. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that, uh, I was going to say a few minutes ago that that brings the score to an interesting point, but I've actually lost interest. <laughs> if you please. Raise your glasses. For Mr. and Mrs. Knees Pale. <laughs> and their son, what? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that does bring us right up to the end of the program now. And as I said, very interesting score. And join us again uh, next week for <laughs> some more fun and games from the teams and from me. Goodbye. William Rushton, Graham Garden, Barry Cryer and Tim Brooke Taylor were being given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Leon Cohen setting some of them to music. Production was by John Castles. <laughs>
and I'm sorry I haven't a clue. The antidote to panel games. And the piano is Dave Lee and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello. Well, first of all, let me introduce the curious assemblage who will hereinafter be referred to as the teams. On the one hand, Tim Brooke Taylor and William Rushton. <laughs> and on the other hand, Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. <laughs> They'll be competing for points, which I shall award or not, as the case may be. The first round is called Censored Songs. I'm going to ask each of you to sing a song, and during the song it will be your task to censor by means of a buzzer any words considered uh, by you to be uh, likely to outrage public decency or frighten the horses. <laughs> so, fingers on the do-it-yourself Mary Whitehouse kit, and away we go. Barry, I'm going to ask you to start with a touch of the wartime nostalgia. <laughs> Again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll again some sunny day. Keep through, just like you always do, until the blue skies drive the dark clouds far away. So will you please to the folks that I tell them I won't be long. They'll be happy to know that as you saw me, I was... <laughs> we'll again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll again, some sunny day. Very good. I prefer that, in fact, to the original. <laughs> Willie Rushton now, there's something from the Fred Astaire songbook, I believe. The best things happen when you're... <laughs> <laughs> things you would not do at home come naturally on the floor. For <laughs> soon becomes... When you hold her in your arms that you've never before <laughs> Even guys with two left <laughs> right if the girl is sweet And if by chance that should While <laughs> Proving that the best things happen when you <laughs> The voice does it Fine, well that puts uh... Barry and Graham in the lead, but uh, <laughs> Willie and Tim have more marks. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is where I introduce well, a round that's played at the end of the programme in order to give the teams time to think of silly names for people arriving at the teacher's ball. We've had uh, that uh, suggestion for an occasion sent in by the Reverend Arnold Page, and just to keep the team on their toes, he sent a couple of suggestions in himself. Mr and Mrs Thmetic and their son, Arithmetic, <laughs> a Mr. and Mrs. Dent Romance, and their son, Stu Dent Romance. We shall see how you fare at the end of the program. Now, tag wrestling. In this round, I'm going to give each team the payoff of a story, and I shall then start one of you off telling a story to fit your punchline. And then when I feel like it, I shall press my buzzer, which goes like that, and a member from the opposing team will have to take up that story, but make it fit his punchline. Now, Tim and Willie, your punchline is, and I'll give, you, give it to you slowly so you can write it down. So the hedgehog pounced and custard flooded the brewery. <laughs> so the hedgehog pounced and custard flooded the brewery. Have you got that? Yes. Barry and Graham, yours coming up. The choir boy went peep, peep, but the cactus wobbled as they sat. <laughs> sat. As they sat. As they sat. Right. Now, to start off, as I gave you yours first, and you've had a bit of time to think, uh, Tim Brooke Taylor, start this off. Chief Inspector Hodgkinson, known as the Hedgehog at the Yard, <laughs> 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 
was strolling along <coughs> outside Buckingham Palace when he suddenly heard sounds of merriment. It was the young prince's birthday party going on. Now, the young prince, as we all know, is called Prince Andrew. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Graham Dunn. Prince Andrew is, in fact, <clears throat> a member of the local choir, the Buckingham Palace choirs, and uh, is known as a choir boy. Uh, Prince Andrew was deeply upset to learn of the recent demise of Hedgehog of the Yard, as he knew him, <laughs> and attended the funeral. <laughs> and shortly after that, went on a tour of America. Over to Willie Rushton. Where, well, indeed, uh, they went to Milwaukee, where Brewers goes quite berserk, but it was during Prohibition. So the Brewers, quite naturally, in those days, turned to producing various forms of other liquid, which they could make with the same vats. Right. Steaming implements. Viz, for instance, custard, which is where the mystery <laughs> comes up. Barry Cryer? An interesting sidelight, but that's having nothing to do with this story. They did, in fact, uh, were, they were taken out, in fact, on day excursion to the desert, and Prince Andrew, known, of course, as the choir boy, uh, was invited to sing with the rest of the choir in the desert. Now, there's a quaint old uh, tradition in the Mojave uh, Desert, uh, among the Indians of the Mojave Desert, uh, a cry of peep, peep, Ask to try, Tim. Which they make <coughs> when they uh, wish to go for a short holiday. <laughs> While on holiday, one of these Indians happened to get the film rights of a British film about an ex-Scotland Yard man called The Hedgehog. But it had to, be, had to be set in America, of course, for the American audience. Where better than Milwaukee, where the brewers produce custard. So the film starts. <laughs> I have this great idea, boss. Cactus custard. Tell me all about it as soon as these choir boys have left the room, said the boss of the brewery. They are about to demonstrate the strange cry of the Indians of the Mojave Desert. Indian oh. choir boys are being wholly irrelevant to the film. The producer said, we can't have more of this, but I do like the inspector. He is excellent. I like the references to prohibition. Those we will keep in, and the custard, it makes for a wonderful denouement. I can almost imagine a denouement now with the inspector. Suddenly, the head of the studio walked in. I have my own ideas on this story. We build up to a climax in the desert where you have this lone choir boy in the rays of the setting sun. Um. Half... What am I talking about, he said. <laughs> I'm having one of my fits again. What I meant to say was the final denouement of this is when the brewery must be destroyed. Um. The hedge. <laughs> and the choir boy, played by Doris Day, comes in <laughs> with a motor horn. <laughs> and finds this cactus, and then for no reason at all, this is the best part of the movie. Doris no Day reason. could play the inspector. <laughs> that isn't bad, said the producer. Or indeed, you could play the custard with Howard Keel. <laughs> Howard Keel possibly doing the brewery number. Now, there's this huge final scene with the Busby Barclay. It's always the brewery. There's the yellowness of the custard spreading yeah. around. And there's the magnificent final scene with Hedgehog in all his glory, he suddenly observes the ancient custom of cactus sitting <laughs> taking place before him at <laughs> the floor of the fern. <laughs> turned round in a wild moment, the hedgehog turned round. <laughs> and he turned round again. He was getting dizzy. <laughs> At this moment, he decided to destroy the brewery, and the hedgehog pounced, and custard flooded the brewery. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'll give you the score later when I've had time to recover from that round. And we go on to the next round, which is the musical story, which is one that we've heard before. In this round, Dave Lee will play a tune, and one of you must start a story relating to the title or mood of that song. And at a signal, Dave will then change the tune, and a member of the opposite team will take up the story, but fitting it to the new tune. Do you all understand that perfectly? No. Right. <laughs> and Barry, we'll start with you. So listen to your tune from Dave Lee. During Vespers that Cyril <laughs> realised that he didn't want to be a choir boy, but in fact a chief inspector at Scotland Yard. <laughs> he ran down the aisle, his young feet clattering upon the ancient stone. Where are you going, the old cried. I'm going to Scotland Yard, he cried, and rushed down to the station, <laughs> across the platform, and boarded a train to Willie. <laughs> Oh, 
offices of Bryant and May. <laughs> Little known theatrical impresarios. They said, don't waste your time, boy. They said, <laughs> going, going into the police business. He said, you're not large enough. And you haven't got the knees for it. He said, look, go into show business. I mean, with a voice like yours, you could go to. <laughs> Graham Gardner. You could go to have piano lessons. <laughs> That's a very good man. Plays on Sundays down the old bull and bush. You go and see him, he'll set you up. Thank you very much, said the choir boy, whose name had escaped everybody's mind. Cyril. 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 <laughs> and off Cyril went. Now, the old bull and bush was a real rumbustious old pub with people swilling beer and sipping gins, and there in the corner he spied... <laughs> Oh Tim Brooklyn, will you wind up the story with this one? Certainly. Three blind mice. At that moment, four pink elephants emerged from a doorway. Five bats that shrieked, Harold Wilson for king. At that moment, we all woke up and it was a happy end. <laughs> 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 Well, all of you who've been following this game so far will be wanting to know what the score is. Graham and Barry won. <laughs> Will, oh, William and Tim in the lead by quite a margin, one and a half. <laughs> and we go on to a game that's called Word for Word. In this round, one of the members of the team says a word and his partner must say another word totally unconnected with the first and so on. The other team may challenge and try and prove a connection. They have buzzers and uh, as soon as they uh, buzz the buzzers, I will ask them to prove the connection. I'm going to start now with you, Willie Rushton. My first word for you is braces. Horse meat. Alarm clock. Ashtray. Red light. Blowing red end A of challenge cigarette. from Barry Crump. Blowing red end of cigarette, ashtray, red light, ashtray. Yeah, really excellent. Very clever. Very, Very good. Yeah, yes, yeah. I think I'll give you that one. <coughs> now then, it's you to start then, Graham Garden, with the word mug. Perambulator. <laughs> challenge, challenge from I didn't clear my brother. Who was that challenge? Was that Tim? They rhyme in Chinese. <laughs> Sideways. <laughs> no, you're, right, you're right as far as Chinese spelling is concerned, but in point of fact, the pronunciation is different. So well, I'm not going to lie. Thank you. Will, will you? Uh, what did you get? How far did you get? Perambulator. Start with perambulator. that one, then. Uh, so it's Graham again, is it? Or yeah. is it uh, with another word. I'll give you another word. Oh, yes, okay. grope. <laughs> Light. Theodolite. Microphone. Shoelace. Artichoke. <laughs> Knee. Pentecost. <laughs> what? Spinach. Well, I'm watching. <laughs> Drama. What about it? Arrow. A uh, challenge there from Willie. Drama and arrows. Westerns. That sort of thing. Not funny, yes, I'll allow that one. <laughs> <laughs> We've got yes. something called Flaming oh, Arrow with Elvis Presley or something. Good challenge. I thought yes. we'd slip that one past. I would start, yeah, uh, yes. Tim, it's over to you now. Your word is sordid. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Um, Willie Rushton. There's two words. Rushton. Vestibule. Exit. Mousetrap. Graham. Challenge. I think vestibule and exit have something in common. I would have thought so. You go in through them both. Not in my book. If you go in I through them both... I have read your book. <laughs> if Mr. you go Chairman. in through them both, it can't have anything to do with an exit, can it? So, uh, so we carry on. <laughs> Willie right Rushton, uh, start it off again with the word tape. Archbishop. Microphone. Worm. Hole. Armageddon. <laughs> Graham, I think I'll award it without listening to your... Archbishop and microphone. <laughs> <laughs> or indeed, worm and hole. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so... Uh, Don't need say any more there, really. Right, Barry, will you start off for your team? This will be the last one now. And it's the word tip. Pardon? <laughs> Thank you, Tim. T-I-P, <laughs> <laughs> tip. Oh. <laughs> Meteorite. Meteorite after the show. Um, <laughs> uh, what did he say? Meteorite. Yeah, so wig. Wig. Off the top of my head. <laughs> um, 
hair fit under the arm. <laughs> Tim, you tell him. Bell. <laughs> I hoped you wouldn't do. <laughs> We can have. I won't allow that one because it, it was uh, it was H uh, A R E, wasn't it? Richard? Yes, of course it was. Yes. Right. Will you start very quickly then with tin opener? Man. Tinned man, which is very popular yes. in certain parts of Africa. Very good. Right. Well, that uh, alters the score considerably. Now we go on to ad lib. <laughs> round which is called ad lib poem. Teams are going to make up a poem. Each team member must keep going until I press the buzzer, which I'll do whenever I like, and then a member of the opposing team must take over. This goes on until the natural artistic conclusion is reached or until I simply can't stand it anymore. The first line of your poem is, and I'm going to ask Graham Garden to start the poem off. And your first line, Graham, is, so off I set with bated breath to luncheon at the Vicar's. <laughs> So off I set with bated breath to luncheon at the Vicar's. And I must say that I did hope my wife would bring <laughs> her tickers, her two alarm clocks that she wore upon each wrist each day. And every time when she got up each morning, I would say, by God, <laughs> surely thou not going to wear two clocks again. Oh, yes, she said. It is extremely fashionable and reminds me I'm not dead. <laughs> because living with you is extremely boring. Because all you do constantly is talk about the flooring. I know you never wanted to go into the church. Barry. And if you do, you leave me in the lurch. By now I am demented, I am deranged, but I have realised the metre it has changed. <laughs> but no, still but... I spoke to her as we both quaffed a cup of tea. I said to her, my love, my love. Are you glad to be wed to me? There is one thing I must say, lad, she said, with great regret. <laughs> the... <laughs> I want a great big furry thing. You'd call it a big great pet. He said, is that what I'd call it, love? She said, you would, I trow. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you mean a pig or even possibly a sow? She said, he said, I forget which now. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter much. <laughs> but if you want to have a sow, then I must build a hut. <laughs> <laughs> but sows, my dear, my wife explained, they live inside a sty. Oh, said the vicar, me, oh my, oh me, I'll get the meter right, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> what I could do for your pet my dear, my duck, my dove, is tear all the flooring up and build something to put up above these amazing animals that you are collecting once a week. <laughs> Stan is a vicar who cannot speak. <laughs> cannot speak, the vicar said. Cannot speak. Nay, nay. <laughs> <laughs> At least I heard that's what he did from an old poacher man. He lived on yonder hill, he did. And he had a frying pan. <laughs> and in that pan he'd cook and cook. <laughs> and things you've never heard. Um, one day, I'll tell you, and it's true, I saw him cook a bird. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, my dear, the vicar then replied. <laughs> my dear, I said, why don't you watch your dong? Then I continued, I saying that I saw this poacher man I don't mind. But when they heard the cooking birds, <laughs> Certain positions were clean. Right, sir. Why not cook choir boy? He be tasty. Go. I think again. I think I've been hasty. He said, and I shall think yet again. Why don't we cook the sow? <laughs> and the vicar said, oh, that's very well, but oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. We'll leave that question hanging. Now, 
do the blues. And for this round, each team will give the other a topic for a blues, which is... Sally and Ben, will you... I told you at the beginning of that round that I'm asked to mark this one for wit, cleanliness and brevity. Good night all. <laughs> Lack of anyway, making Anyway, Tim and Willie, it's your turn to give a subject, please, to Barry and Graham. Uh, the, the Crufts Dog Show. Crufts. Thank you, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the point of the programme where I go home so that I can miss your announcements of the arrivals at the teacher's ball. So, so as soon as you've thought of one, start it off, and I'll be back later. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Mattix and their rather posh daughter, Martha Mattix. <laughs> oh, please well. Mr. and Mrs. Present and their children. Smith, present. Wilkinson, present. <laughs> and oh. Mr. and Mrs. Master Study. Oh. <laughs> they were kind. And their son, Ed, Master Study. <laughs> Pray be crouched. <laughs> <laughs> For Mr. and Mrs. London Education Authority and their daughter, Ina London <laughs> Please give a friendly welcome, please, to Mr. and Mrs. Arbun and their paromaniac son. Gone. Gone. Known as the Bun Son Burner. Oh. Have you spotted over there in the doorway? Yes, I have. Mr. and Mrs. Gibrazasod and their son, Al Gibrazasod. <laughs> Hurriedly followed, and will you welcome, please, Mr. and Mrs. Nometry and their horse, Trigger. <laughs> While we're on the subject of paramania, <laughs> oh, will you welcome, please, Mr. and Mrs. Scale and their fire-raising son, Burnham Scale. <laughs> Let us hear it for Mr. and Mrs. Igitter and their colourful offspring from the deep south, Gordy Amos Igitter. <laughs> Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Turchips and their daughter, Miss Turchips. <laughs> Miss, <laughs> who's just I, Miss Turchips. <laughs> Man, will you welcome, oh, please? A warm a hand. A squash in the doorway. <laughs> <laughs> Quit pushing, please. For Mr. and Mrs. Kate of Education and their distinguished military son, General Sir Tiffy Kate of Education. <laughs> <laughs> Followed by corporal punishment. <laughs> Not to mention Mr. and Mrs. 
and bottom. <laughs> and their daughter, K and bottom. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Day Levels and their son, <laughs> Owen Day Levels. At this well. point, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, uh, we come to the end of our contest. The score is a very interesting score at the moment. What is the score? Uh, I'll tell you. <laughs> are we behind? Tim and Willie are behind. Oh, in that case, would you please welcome <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Slips Drive Me Mad and their son, <laughs> Jim Slips Drive Me Mad. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Bus and their daughter, Scylla Bus. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Apple for the teacher. <laughs> Best of luck. And their Granny Smith. Well, with Graham and Barry fighting back uh, courageously. <laughs> and also their French grammar. <laughs> <laughs> that last uh, insert uh, puts Tim and Willie in the lead for this week. And unless the BBC comes to their senses in the meantime, we shall all be back with you again next week. present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, The Antidote to Panel Games. And the piano is Dave Lee and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello, and if you're looking forward to another keenly fought contest of wit, memory and skill, then you should be tuned to Yesterday in Parliament. We're going to play... <laughs> we're going to play I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue with Barry Cryer and Graham Garden. <laughs> and Tim Brooke Taylor and William Rushton. And I'm here because it's half an hour out of the cold, so let's start with round one, which is called Censored Songs. Dave Lee at the piano will give uh, each member of the teams an intro of a well-known song, and they have to sing it. But they have to censor, by means of a buzzer, any words which they consider will outrage public decency or frighten the horses. <laughs> so we're going to start now with Barry Cryer, and Dave Lee, will you introduce a song to Barry? Early one morning, just as the was rising, I saw a maiden in the valley below. Oh, don't me. Oh, never me. How could you a poor maiden so? Now, will you rush it? Quite enough of that one. <laughs> I think it would be invidious to uh, give uh, one team or another more marks than the others, so I'm not going to give any of them any. <laughs> I'm going to say that this is where I introduce a round that's played at the end of the program, so that the teams have time to think of silly names for people arriving at the Cleric's Ball. And uh, once oh. again, the Reverend Arnold Page of Castle Carey in Somerset has sent in that suggestion and has also uh, given us a couple of his examples to show the standard to which the teams have to aspire at the end of this program. His examples are, for instance, the Venerable and Mrs. Balls and their oh. son, Canon Balls, <laughs> Sister Mary Lacroix and her nephew, Evan Lacroix. <laughs> They are teams, start thinking now, and we come, we come to a new game which is called a right pair. In this round, one team pretends to be a pair of something, pepper and salt, or Burke and Hare, or Muir and Norden, or whatever, and they give, give the other team a clue, and they have ten questions to guess, and our audience will be shown on a board here what it is they're trying to guess, and I hope in passing you'll show it to me as well. So, um, 
Tim and Willie, you're going to do the first one, and uh, we await with bated breath the arrival of the board, which is now going to show the audience what it is. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to guess it, or... Sorry. No, you're going to do it. You're going, it's going to be your... You've got to give them the clue. And Barry and Graham are going to try and guess it. And it's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> I hope. Well, it's... Willie's quite clean and... I'm... quite small in many ways. <laughs> My heart bleeds, but will you give us a clue? <laughs> Barry and Graham, we've had the clue. Let's see if oh. we can get it in ten o'clock. <laughs> well now, Willie's quite clean. Quite clean. Tim's. Tim's, <laughs> Tim's small. Tim's, yes, yes. Are you... Do we get to know if it's animal, vegetable or mineral or not? All animal. All animal. Human. Actually on Saturday nights. That's not a clue. <laughs> Graham asks human. Hume, yes. It's a pair of people. It's More uh, coupling than a pair, but that's not really right either. <laughs> oh, you've seen that version too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Willie is one character, and I am not entirely one character. You're more than one. <laughs> You're several people. Yes. Are you, in fact, not so much a pair as an eightsome? Yes. <laughs> Got to be Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Right. Excellent. Excellent. And Barry and Graham got that one in six, so now uh, it's your time to give the clue, Barry and Graham, and Tim and Billy, you have to guess. So first of all, your clue, Graham. Uh, our clue is old cars and TV series. And they're bangers and mash. Bangers and mash. <laughs> and uh, they want to know if it's animal, vegetable or mineral. Animal and vegetable. Old cars and TV, TV series. series. Which is which? Um, Barry, are you old Graham, cars? Graham is old cars and I'm... I'm Graham's the clapped out old banger. And <laughs> Uh, we got that in two. That puts the score now in a position where the tension is well nigh unbearable. In fact, it is unbearable, so I won't uh, go further into that. And we go on to blues. And in this round, as you know, if you've followed this game for a long time, uh, each team will give the other the topic for a blues, which they must then improvise, accompanied by Dave Lee at the piano. Barry and Graham, will you give Willie and Tim their blues, please? The French Lessons Blues. <laughs> Lessons that I want. Oh, yeah. I want, Willie, won't. I wanted to speak French ever since I was in the funk. Oh, yeah, baby, I like it, baby. I saw a card in the news agent saying French lessons second floor. She said that'll be five pounds, dearie. What do you say? Well, I plumed a matter. <laughs> well, Tim and Willie get off the mark there with 13. And uh, it's your turn to give Barry and Graham their title. Uh, the Opinion Poll Blues. Wonderful. An early call. And out of bed I did roll. Out of bed, out of bed I did roll. I really rolled out of bed. I saw a horse holding 
up the telegraph wires, bless my soul. Bless my soul. I said, horse, what are you doing? He said, you're not going to believe them. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a gallop pony. So that puts the teams pretty well ahead of each other. And we go on to the game, the game, which is called, as you know, tag wrestling. In this round, I'm going to give each team the payoff of a story, and I shall then start one of you off telling the story to fit your punchline. And then when I feel like it, I shall press the buzzer, which sounds like this. In fact, it's not a buzzer, it's a bell this time, and it goes... And a member from the opposing team will have to take up that story, but make the story fit his punchline. And the first team to reach their particular punchline, if either of them are so lucky as to do that, will win the round. Now, Barry and Graham, your punchline, if you'll uh, take it down, is this. The stock market panicked as Mrs. Driscoll's behind went west. <laughs> You've got that one? And Tim and Willie, here's your punchline. The mayor shrieked. That's a mayor, Lord Mayor type mayor, not a <coughs> lady horse. Lady Mayor. As he felt her touch halfway up. Oh, hum, don't Finish, hum, finish, please. Ben Nevis. <laughs> anti climax All right. Now, uh, Barry and Graham, you've had the longest to uh, think of how to embark on your story, so will you start, please, working towards your punchline? The stock exchange was in a turmoil. Who was this Mrs. Driscoll, they were all asking? Is she a front? Or is she here behind? <laughs> Confusion reigned. Uh, tellers and jobbers were rushing about on the tell and, and on all sorts of... <laughs> all sorts of activities. And... Willie. Far away from the hubbub of the city. <laughs> from the old lady of Threadneedle Street. Mrs. Driscoll's sister, Eva, <laughs> was halfway up Ben Nevis. Clambering <clears throat> <laughs> up towards... The traditional yearly outing of the Corporation of Bootle. We used to set off at the top of Ben Nevis to celebrate certain things, you know, rustic ways and... Well, spring being what it is in Bootle, people like to dart up Ben Nevis, particularly if you're wearing mayoral robes. <laughs> Which they were not. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, back with the old lady of Threadneedle Street, Mrs Driscoll herself, panic broke out on the stock market as she brought in a small form of deer, gazelle or antelope. It was, in fact, a hind. Get that bee hind out of here, cried leading stockbrokers of the day, with less wit than judgment. <laughs> and while you're about it, remove Mrs. Driscoll and take her to a place where she can be no longer recovered. <laughs> I would like to announce, said the man in charge of the stock market, a story. <laughs> I would like to tell a story about last year, when I took part in the Ben Nevis <laughs> Shut up, you old bore, they all cried at the stock market. We don't want to hear your Ben Nevis tales. What about Mrs. Driscoll and this hind that is running amok in the stock market? We can, cannot carry on our normal business. Suddenly, the hind let out um... If what happens this afternoon on Ben Nevis ever hits the stock market, the pound will be down like a rock. It'll have a rotten day. They'll all be going around saying, what a rotten day the pound's had. My word, I wish I was halfway up Ben Nevis. <laughs> Eva is secreting his enormous passion for the mayor. But I sinuous hand began as they mounted. He was in front of her, a fortunate position for her to set off up his robes. <laughs> <laughs> Out at about punch. halfway <laughs> along the terminal third of his fibula, a piercing scream rent the air, and the mayor turned just in time to see Eva spiralling downwards to the base of Ben Nevis, never to be seen again. Where, where am I, he said, where am I? And somebody said, you've just fallen asleep, you've woken up. He said, but, but she spiralled out, only a dream, they say. <laughs> She's just behind you, and the mayor shrieked as he felt a touch. <laughs> it was only a dream? Oh, what a relief. And then realised he was uh, <laughs> still asleep and the only a dream statement had been a dream. Enough of this nonsense. <laughs> Enough of this nonsense. He finally worked... Actually, Barry's taking the words out of my mouth. <laughs> the 
because in a kind of inadvertent spasm, I stopped uh, Tim in the middle of uh, the actual punchline, and I think he'd reached it. Don't you agree, audience, that we should give that up? Love it. No. Never. No. Never. <laughs> Never. The whole programme seems to have got into a serious vein, and we stay in it now for the round that we call simply opera. And it's a musical round, mm. and I want you to sing a snatch of grand opera from a selected passage from a libretto which I shall give you. Barry and Graham, we're going to start with you. And your words come from the home handyman, from the section devoted to fixing to walls and ceilings. Dave Lee will give you an introduction. <laughs> Tim and Willie, your one comes from the Italian phrase book from the section devoted to miscellaneous expressions. A marker page. Dave, can you give us a shortish introduction? <laughs> With that uh, operatic uh, performance, Willie and Tim are so far ahead that it's only for contractual reasons that Graham and Barry are remaining <laughs> in the post. <laughs> we come to the round which is called Adlib Poem. And as you know, I uh, get the teams to make up a poem. I give them uh, the first line of the poem, and each member must keep going until I ring the bell, and then a member of the opposing team must take over. This goes on until... Well, if you've any experience of this program... <laughs> It's true to say that this goes on ad infinitum. <laughs> and I'm going to give you the first line, so here it is. Belay, hall two, a vast behind. <laughs> We've got to catch that lugger. <laughs> Incidentally, I mark here for poetic feeling, sensitivity, and, and the absence of rude words. <laughs> oh, Barry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Belay Hall 2, if asked behind, we've got to catch that lugger. 
But first, let's not all dash away. We'll have some tea with sugar. <laughs> we'll have a cup of tea, I cried. And perhaps some crumpets too. And then we'll go and chase the boat. But first I'm going to loo. <laughs> Then I retired in my smart suit. It was so dapper and neaty. I found... <laughs> neaty! Where is neaty? So I hove me towards the Elson. Which, for advertising reasons, I shall refer to as a sweetie. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> there I repaired. The boat adrift. I thought I'd have a read. Jog through the manual of how to sail or how to plant some seed. <laughs> I noticed that the boat was drifting towards the coast of Brazil. <laughs> I'll say that daunting prospect did make me feel quite ill. Thank you. <laughs> For that applause. <laughs> Brazil, I thought, a foreign land with strange and savage customs. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and then I thought again some more. <laughs> they also have Keep tall bossmen. <laughs> Tall busman, I thought to myself, thought I, in Brazil by the sea. Can this be me that's talking? Is it really, really me? <laughs> it was, I found out to my cost. And I'll tell you, my name is L Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> now I recall you very well. I met you once in Florence. <laughs> You were a very sporty chap, so fond of games like rugger. But the thing that I always remember is you couldn't rhyme with logger. How are you? How are you, Larry? Then I cried. How have things really been? I'll... I heard you'd been the victim of a certain cardinal sin. <laughs> Cardinal Sin. <laughs> Cardinal Sin has been returned and is now back in the Vatican. I must say, I agree with you. I hope I never see that rat again. <laughs> but now accompany me. I like Terence. My lad. <laughs> but now accompany me, my lad, to yonder, yonder, yonder hostelry. And there we'll drink the night away with... 15 pints of tea. <laughs> and when our tea has all been drunk and we are on the floor, we'll shout out, Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> Bring us here, 15 pints more. <laughs> After this, we had to go, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Behind me was a little chap I thought just looked just like a gnome. But after 15 pints of tea, I went wee, wee, wee all the way. <laughs> well, if that's not an artistic conclusion, I don't know what it is. Right, well, this is the point in the programme where I go home so that I can miss your announcements for the arrivals teams at the Clerics Ball. Mr. and Mrs. Bate and their daughter, Sally Bate. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, a quiet oh, welcome, please. Quiet. <laughs> they got it. Another quiet welcome, please. <laughs> or Mr. and Mrs. Chester Cathedral and their daughter, Wynne Chester Cathedral. <laughs> Sober up in the vestry. <laughs> Here come Mr. and Mrs. Lations and their son, the Ray V. Lations. <laughs> Leap up and down and throw your gators in the air, if you will. <laughs> or Mr. and Mrs. Bible and their newt. 
estimate. <laughs> Not to mention. <laughs> Better not to. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Peria and their mother, Sue Peria. <laughs> Tim was right. Well, while we're not mentioning anything, Mr. and Mrs. Rage Tea Party and their son, Vic Rage Tea Party. <laughs> From the Orient. <laughs> yes, welcome. But not with his wife, so we'll never know the truth. <laughs> the wonderfully virile Bishop of Shanghai <laughs> and his youngest son, him number 33. <laughs> Trying to follow that, but the door's jammed. <laughs> oh no, they're in here. The clerical zoo gang. The, <laughs> the welcome, Reverend welcome. Hush and his two puppies. <laughs> his cat, Ikism. His crow, Zia. Luther, the papal bull. <laughs> and some yards behind, his skunk, affectionately known to us all as the family pew. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, will you pay careful attention, please, to the arrival of Mr. Sam Lila and Sam's son, Andy Lila. <laughs> also for Mrs. and Mrs. Iced Milk and Pasta. <laughs> <laughs> Turn your faces to the wall. <laughs> An onrush of clerical streakers, the Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> no, no swearing in church, please. <clears throat> Will you lift up your hearts, please, <laughs> to Mr. and Mrs. In Excelsis Deo and their daughter Gloria? Glory. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that the scores are Graham and Barry, 77, Tim and Willie, 104, the audience, 33. <laughs> and it brings us... A last desperate <laughs> entrance by Mr and Mrs Spray and their daughter, Letty Spray, <laughs> and her friend, Neil. <laughs> And, and we this... cannot... We Sorry. cannot... We Sorry. squashed in the doorway. <laughs> you first. No, it's all right. Church doors are pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> Mr no, I... and Mrs E. do well. <laughs> Their ecclesiastical son, Dean E. do well. Mr and Mrs Ain and their daughter Audrey, who prefers to be known simply as Aud Ain. <laughs> and pray also silence for the host. <laughs> Yes, that's all, ladies and gentlemen, so till next time, thank you and good night. We present I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. <laughs> The piano is Dave Lee, and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Hello again, and in another attempt to take panel games off the air, we have on my left Barry Cryer in Graham Garden. <laughs> and on my right, Tim Brooke Taylor and William Rushton. They'll be playing a series of absurd games, and if I can't think of anything better to do, I shall award them points. <laughs> First game, with that subtlety with, for which this uh, program, indeed this entire network is famous, is called Words of One Song to the Tune of Another. You got the picture, folks? And I want each team to sing the words of one song to the tune of another, provided oh. by Dave Lee at the piano. Now, Barry and Graham, I'd like you to start. Will you sing Charlie is My Darling to the tune of O Soli Mio? <laughs> Oh, no. 
bottle of gondoliers. We'll give you uh, four marks for that. Tim and Willie, will you sing Tutti Frutti to the tune of Secret Love? <laughs> According to audience reaction, you uh, take the lead there with ten marks, and we go on to the point in the programme where I introduce a round that's played, in fact, at the end of the programme, uh, in order to give the teams uh, time to think of silly names for people arriving at the politician's ball. Once again, that uh, occasion was suggested to us by <laughs> Reverend Arnold Page of Castle Carey in Somerset, and he's once again sent us a couple of suggestions which will have to be matched by the team at the end of the programme. Here's our Senator and Mrs. Lees P. King and their son Frank Lees P. King. <laughs> and Governor and Mrs. Garkey and their son Ollie Garkey. <laughs> well, that Deep rocking is imminent. I think he's very good. Enough. <laughs> The team's going to make up a poem, and each team member must keep going until I press this buzzer, which goes like this. And then a member of the opposite team must take over. This goes on until we reach our artistic, natural conclusion, or the whole thing falls apart at the seams. And I'm going to start now with William Rushton. And the first line of your poem is, He pulled against the running tide, the oars squeaked in the rollocks. <laughs> Can I write to my mother, <laughs> No, Willie. He recently translated into Chinese the collected works of Gollocks, <laughs> the tale of a famous huntsman who clad in hunting pink, which seemed totally irrelevant and quite boring to a chink. Uh, <laughs> however, there he was, in his tiny boat, setting out to sea. Good, Good heavens, what is that, he cried. There, ahead of me. It is a monster rising up from out the waves, so flecked. Oh, God, he cried, I've done a rhyme, and now this boy I've wrecked. But I will think of a rhyme for flecked. I will think of one, cried he. Flecked, flecked. In the boat he went, the storm went down. Ha, ha, ha. The boat, it crept. In pieces, one and two. <laughs> he sounded like an animal <laughs> who lives in London Zoo. <laughs> an elephant. Oh, 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 oh! It's the animal of which I speak. <laughs> it sounds like a cock elephant. <laughs> now, I heard one last week. <laughs> And so to London Zoo he rode, up the Regent's Canal. And there upon the bike, the bike, bank, <laughs> there upon the bank he spied a very good old pal, a riding of his bike. He was a riding to the zoo. He had an urge to contemplate both ends of a new. Uh, he thought that something interesting might leap into his mind, and so he started at the front as opposed to the behind. Uh, this being the more savoury view of the two, um, a fact he knew so well. <laughs> he said this is a fruitless task. Oh, cock elephant, go to hell. I have more interesting things to do. I'll go and look at my stamps that I <laughs> can say to somebody <laughs> uh, <laughs> stamps uh, yes. uh, I have got the cramps <laughs> 
I've got the cramps, I'll tell you why a minute or two from now. When I have thought of something else than you silly old cow. I will tell you why, and this is why I'll tell you so, tis true. <laughs> I've got a house that's pink and white and it is also blue. Blue, you say? What has this to do with the story we've been telling? <laughs> Thanks. Nothing at all. Back to the zoo, he hurried, loudly yelling. Oh, keeper, tell me, of the new, the front or back to choose. I was thinking of translating it into ancient Greek, but I've gone back on the booze. <laughs> I tried my ancient Greek last night on an aging bartender. Who didn't seem to like it at all. But the barmaid, who was slender, said, I like Greek. I always have. <laughs> and in my spare hours here, I translate iambic pentameters. Well, I means I'm only here for the beer. <laughs> Here's a minor classic, I think. <laughs> this next round is called Thumbnail Sketches, and I'm going to give each team the name of a well-known person, and I want them to go on about that person for 30 seconds. Marks will be given for any new information about the person, and you'll be responsible for your own legal fees. <laughs> right, now we'll start with Barry and Graham. Uh, will you talk for 30 seconds on Virginia Woolf? <laughs> Virginia Woolf, right. Um, yes, she was a lady. And uh, wrote books. One of them was called The Lighthouse, and the rest of them weren't. <laughs> she was born just outside Cheadle in Cheshire. She was a great surprise to her mother, who was in Manchester at the time. <laughs> Contrary to popular rumour, which claimed she was born just outside Wedlock Village in Yorkshire. She was a solicitor for several years, but the fines proved exorbitant. Uh, <laughs> And in, uh, she made her first television appearance, <laughs> this is the Virginia Woolf we're talking about, in 1954 when she did in fact beat Mick McManus by two falls in the submission <laughs> in the fifth round. The other Virginia Woolf you're thinking of, um, we finished talking about some time ago. Okay, six points in there and we go quick as a flash to Tim and Willie who are going to talk for 30 seconds on Davy Crockett. David Crockett was a well-known hat maker. Yes, he, he wore a, a coon-skin hat. Yes. Or sometimes he'd just slip the middle of a beaver and just clap it on his head. <laughs> <laughs> he, he died, he died at the Alamo under rather tragic circumstances. The, the coon wasn't happy about skin. Yeah. Did he? <laughs> he, he, wrestled, said, he wrestled with I a bear, that. thinking possibly turning that. It was an enormous hat. He, went to, he stood for Parliament. Not for Parliament. He, he went to Washington. He stood for the Queen. He had a very, very boring song written about him by Walt Disney. <laughs> yes. um, other well-known facts about him um, are that... Um, he died at the Alamo again, yes, later. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably one of the best... In another films. film starring John Wayne, as opposed to one with Fess Parker, who died rather better. No, I'm still very in that with that... Uh, round. Um, Tim and Willie have gone into the lead by 17 points. And we come to the round which is called Bedtime Story. For this round, I want one of the members oh. of, each, of a team to make up a bedtime story. From time to time, he'll give his partner a signal for a suitable sound effect to reinforce the dramatic effect of the narrative. Well, for extra excitement, the person doing the effects will be wearing headphones with music playing to prevent him from hearing the story. Tim, will you start the story? And I want your story to be about a deaf owl in a far-off land. Uh, <clears throat> this story takes place in Scotland, this far-off land, um, where <laughs> on the 14th of July, every year, Gordon McHamish would go out onto the moors and he would cry, <laughs> which would frighten the villagers. <laughs> Suddenly, there came towards him this creature that was making this noise. It was indeed his mother, who was loony at the time. <laughs> and she would cry, Hamish, she'd cry, Hamish, whatever you do, don't go near the... <laughs> Railway station. <laughs> But of course, Hamish, being a stupid lad, went down and he waited for the train. And as the train came, he could hear it in the distance coming round the corner. And the train went. 
Uh, I'll run out of implements. <laughs> That is why this story is interesting. There was an owl, you see, who was deaf. And because it was deaf, instead of going to it to woo, it always used to go, Peter, you with the stars, your eyes. <laughs> well, I thought the way those two worked together was positively oh. uncanny. <laughs> Uncanny, and they haven't finished yet. <laughs> now, Barry and Graham, who's going to tell the story? I am. Graham's going to. Graham's do the coming job. out in the front, well, and no, while he's doing no, that, uh, Barry, I'll tell you that your story must be about a mouse and an elephant on a desert island. Mouse and elephant on a desert. A mouse island. and an elephant on a desert island. Mon Where you go, Barry? Monty Mouse lived on a desert island with an elephant. Monty and the elephant were great friends, and the Monty's great joy was when they'd wake up in the morning, and the elephant would look over at him and go. <laughs> There's something different about you, said Monty. <laughs> One day, they found some footprints in the sand. Good heavens, said Monty. I thought we were alone on the island. Do you think there's a... <laughs> Life-size replica of Percy Edwards on the island with us? <laughs> Not at all. I think it must be Man Friday. And sure enough... Behind the palm tree, they heard a sudden sound. <laughs> no. <laughs> it must be Saturday, he said. Because I always used to listen to Brands Hatch on the radio. And suddenly, from the radio, they heard... <laughs> Jack DiManio snapped again, said Monty. So they turned the radio off and ran round the back of the tree. And there was Man Friday. Hello there, he said. Come and have a meal with us. Let us have some sausages in the frying pan. So they tossed them in the frying pan and the sausages fizzed and crackled and went... <laughs> they were, of course, bangers. <laughs> Very good. I enjoyed that. Lots of lovely marks all round. We go on to the next round, which is called <laughs> Initials. And this is a round which was sent in by a listener, by Lynn Anderson oh. of Old Coolston, Surrey. And this is a, an entertaining one. I'm going to read each team some abbreviations, and they must tell me what they think each stands for. These are, in fact, initials. I'm going to start now with uh, you, Graham and Barry. Your initials are B-E-F. B-E-F, but I must tell you that this is not, uh, not. not capital initials, it's small initials. Oh, ah, the little British expedition, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's the keep the E out of beef campaign. <laughs> Uh, no, British didn't. egg fanciers, no. <laughs> Small eggs. Um, um, Bolivian etymologists. <laughs> yes. Um, Fancy pizza. I'll give you a clue as you're lagging by 74 marks. It is uh, an instruction that you see on a packet. Oh, open before March the 3rd and the rest has been torn off. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Point. I don't think you're going to get this. Small B, yes. Edible yes. foodstuffs. B. Uh, the instruction is the blunt floor. end first. <laughs> That's what I meant. That's what I said. Right, Tim and Willie, your one is... On foodstuffs? I didn't say foodstuffs, I just said a packet. On your one, Tim and Willie, <laughs> is D-O-R... That's... <laughs> Blunt end first on Irish deodorants. <laughs> right. Tim and Willie, your one is D-O-R-I-S. Oh. oh. <laughs> That's a misprint. Actually, <laughs> just met her in the pub before, didn't we? Um, D-O-R-I-S, as in Doris, is it? Exactly. Doris yeah. owes Rushton one shilling. <laughs> I'm going to give you that one. 
uh, not the shilling, the, the, the mark. Uh, it is, in fact, direct order recording and invoicing system. Isn't that exciting? Uh, so exciting that we'll rush on to the next round. And this one's sound charades. We've played this before, and lo and behold, we're going to play it again. Uh, one team has to make noises, and the other team has sketched what they mean. The audience are let into the secret and can help by applauding when they're getting warmer and doing the other thing when they're not. And you at home will hear the secret too by means of our mystery voice. Let me ask you, Barry and Graham, first, is this a, a film or a play or a book or whatever? This is a Christmas carol. A Christmas carol. Our audience will be shown it on the board. <laughs> and the carol is The Holly and the Ivy. The Holly and the Ivy. How many, how many words? Five. <laughs> Five? Five. Five. Uh. The Holly and the Ivy. <laughs> So far, so good. I cannot understand. Now, now you try and guess what we were going to do. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's basically old Stanley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, that was good. I can't understand how you took 45, 45 seconds to get that, but still. Uh, now, Tim and Willie, what is yours? Uh, a play or a film or what? It's a film. The film. And it's got three words. And Tim and Willie's is day for night. Day for night. Right, hope you've heard at home have heard it by our mystery voice. We're going to do all three words at once, if we may. <laughs> okay. How are you going to do Gatsby? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guessed wrong. <laughs> okay, Willie. <laughs> Sir Alec, Doris is here. Yeah. <laughs> See you Would you like it again? <laughs> we'll do another version if that's more difficult. All right. Move for Billy. Sir Alec, Doris is here. <laughs> for you. Oh, we've got another one. Wake up, Sir Lancelot. <laughs> <laughs> night, night, uh, night and day. So near. You. Night and the ivy. No. You got it. Why? You got it. No. No. They didn't. No. No. They're, oh, they're no, singing night and day at the moment, which is another round altogether. Oh. Day and night. Day for night. Day for. Barry, you said? Day for night. Day for night, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the blues now. Oh. In this round, as you all know, each team gives the other a topic for a blues, which they must then improvise, accompanied by Dave Lee at the piano, and Graham and Barry are going to start by giving uh, a, a topic to Tim and Willie. Yes, we, uh, yes we're going to give them the News of Vendors blues. Seven and a half blues. <laughs> okay, uh, so Tim and Willie, it's for you to give Graham and Barry their topic. Mother in law blues. <laughs> She walks down the street, all the way machines leap back into the chemist shop. <laughs> and that's a fact. Right, well, I'd better tell you before we go on to the next round that that leaves the score in a quite an interesting position with Willie and Tim 108 and 
Barry and Graham, 801. <laughs> or vice versa. Now we go to the point where I sort of back out of the proceedings and leave the teams to give their announcements for the arrivals at the politicians' ball. Hey, wave something tasteful. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> For Mr. and Mrs. Secretary and their long-haired son, Furry Ian Secretary. Furry Ian. Mr. and Mrs. The Exchequer. And their rather dodgy daughter, Chancy Laura The Exchequer. <laughs> I'd like you to welcome, please, Mr. and Mrs. Stir of Agriculture and Fisheries. And their daughter, Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. <laughs> From Glasgow, uh-huh. will you now wish you in for Mr. and Mrs. Sack and their son, Wall Sack? Oh. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Patrick, entry debate, <laughs> and his Pa Liam entry debate? Pa Exchanging Liam entry a debate. joke in the corner, Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> Ding Voter and their daughter Flo. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Tix, their daughter Polly. Stand back! <laughs> I'm standing, I'm standing back. Well, Mr. Back. and Mrs. Chers and their evil piratical son, Black Ben Chers. <laughs> oh. Oh. And over from France is the Marquis de Sade and the party whips. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Festo oh. and their son, Party Manny. <laughs> Festo. And, Festo. From, <laughs> and from Germany, please, no hard feelings. <laughs> Herr and Frau Ard and their son, Hans. <laughs> A Miss- moment of decency. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. the old member for Epping North, shut up. And their son, Will, the old member for Epping North, shut up. <laughs> At that point, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of the programme with Barry and Graham so far in the lead that I doubt whether Willie and Tim could possibly... Mr poss- and Mrs Mandarin and her son, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> and her friend, Sybil Service. <laughs> oh. Well, you'd be surprised, be surprised to learn that Willie and Tim didn't catch up. And, and their uh, friend, Anne Arkis. Not a very good friend. <laughs> and that won't do them any good either. Pot, pot. <laughs> <laughs> and Ricky with the first results, and their son, Billy Ricky with the first results. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Ah, ah. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Until next week, when we'll all be with you again. Goodbye now. William Rushton, Graham Garden, Barry Pryor and Tim Brooke Taylor were given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Dave Lee setting some of them to music. Production was by John Castles. We present I'm Sorry, I Haven't a Clue, the antidote to panel games. At the piano is Leon Cohen, and your chairman is Humphrey Littleton. Thank you. Well, we've got two teams tonight to take the euphemism out of panel games. Barry Crowder and Graham Garden. And Timothy Brooke Taylor and William Rushton. And I'm paid to keep the score, which means they get me pretty cheap. The first round is called A New Musical Story to distinguish it from the old musical story, which you don't want to hear again. This is a round in which I shall start off a story and then hand it over to a member of one of the teams. And as they take up the story, <laughs> it says here, Leon Cohen will play a tune. <laughs> which is very wise. You don't expect him to just sit there, do you? <laughs> no, 
the title of the tune that he plays, they must incorporate naturally into the story. They must then hand it over to a member of the opposing team in the same way. The whole thing is thoroughly elegant and gracious. Now, I'm going to throw the opening line of the story to you, Graham Garden. Suddenly the fog lifted and Mary gave a start of surprise. Say frog. <laughs> Suddenly, the frog lifted. <laughs> Mary, pun. Have it your way. Oh, <laughs> said the frog. <laughs> and Mary gave a start of surprise. <laughs> Out on a hill, an animal stood on its own. Mary and the frog. Looked through the window, and the animal seemed to be listening. I wonder, said Mary, what the lonely goat heard. <laughs> Which the frog replied. Roll out. The frog replied. The frog replied. The frog replied. He had a toad in his throat. <laughs> Roll out the barrel, he said, and I will wet my whiskers, and then I'll be able to speak properly. For today, I give <laughs> my maiden speech right. <laughs> in the House of Commons. <laughs> this is a frog warning. <laughs> oh, you've got to be one jump ahead. Anyway. <laughs> oh, hopeless. Anyway. <laughs> This speech will last 20 minutes, and I wish everybody to hear every moment of it. I shall start like this. Anna. I shall start by kicking both my legs in the air, which will attract attention, said the frog. And then I should exhort the house to give me the moonlight. At this point, thank you. At this point... I may croak due to the lack of fibre in my tonsils and a man in my throat. That's what I meant. A lesser version of an earlier joke, but you know what politicians are. But then I shall go back to the hustings, a lovely couple, and I shall say to them, what this country needs is... like that. <laughs> <laughs> what the muck they're serving up today. What we need are songs like Any Old On and um, Roll Out the Barrel, who was a wonderful woman. <laughs> <laughs> so was Annie Old On, too. Annie, of oh, oh, yes. Wonderful. Mm. So, yes. this bird, were she to press her lips to... It's very unlikely that she would. <laughs> and those of you who have kissed frogs will know... Not even on the off chance they turn into something is most remote. But were I to say to her, look. <laughs> and I were the only frog. <laughs> Nothing else would matter in the world today, said the frog. At which Mary, her eyes suddenly misted, and she saw before her the frog of her dreams. <laughs> Bending over him, Gently, she kissed him on the top of his head. And suddenly... <laughs> she was... Uh, she was leaning on a lamppost um. at the corner of the street, which is the way she made most of her living. <laughs> <laughs> and she explained to the magistrate... <laughs> I kissed the frog. How was I to know it was going to be a print when she woke up next morning? <laughs> There's a version there somewhere. And the magistrate replied, Madam, am I expected to believe this? Because I have lived for a long time in... Neesden. <laughs> And as a magistrate in Neesden, I often used to say to defendants, 
picture you upon my knees, Dan, and picture the fate that can, in fact, thank you very much, better late than never, picture the fate that can overcome you. The country is in a state of decadence. On all sides, we see morals decaying, standards debased. What is going to happen to this country? Are we all going to... Sixty-four. It's bloody unlikely. <laughs> and then he remembered the words of his old Chinese singing teacher, <laughs> who he had personally garroted. So rotten was he. <laughs> Better a frog in the throat than a toad in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Tim and Willie, 12 points, and Graham and Barry, only three. It's disgraceful. <laughs> this is where I introduce a round that's played at the end of the programme, uh, so that the teams can have time to think of silly names for people arriving at the pharmacist's ball. The pharmacist's pharmacist ball. And those of you listening at home might like to think up some names of your own to apply to this programme. Anyway, the next game <laughs> is called A Right Pair. And in this round, one team pretends to be a pair of something, pepper and salt, or Muir and Norton, or whatever. Although well, whatever isn't a pair, I didn't see. They give the other team a clue, and they have ten questions to guess the answer. It's your turn, Barry and Graham, to help the other side to earn a few points. Meanwhile, the board is being shown to our audience. Barry and Graham are cash and carry. Cash and carry. <laughs> most of whom read the words on it so loud that I don't imagine this round is going to go on for very long. Uh, Graham will define himself. Uh, yes, yes I, I'm the first of the pair. I'm mineral. And I'm sort of abstract, really. <laughs> are you solid, Graham? Pretty. Hmm. I know yes. you're pretty, but are you solid? <laughs> it's about, it's about. <laughs> Would I eat you? <laughs> No. Oh, come on. <laughs> Would I wear you? No. Could I suffer from the abstract acutely? Uh, no, not unduly, no. I don't think so That's at all. a comfort in this day and age. <laughs> Seven to go. Um, the two of you together weren't terribly funny, so... No. No, so it's... Did you try to be as a pair? <laughs> no. No, no, no. 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 Very straight one, this. Down goes Mike and Bernie Winters, then. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> if it's mineral and abstract, could it be pith and wind? <laughs> you said uh, I couldn't suffer acutely from the abstract. That's right, and I do. <laughs> It could be piss and wind, but it isn't. Well, you've had four, but I think I will to hurry you along, so I'll say you've had could seven. Could we have a slightly... Could we have a clue of some sort? Both words begin with the same letter. Shopping. Cod and chips. <laughs> Fish and pips. Uh, cod and chips, cod and chips is right in the... The procedure undergone way. in the purchase of cod and chips is, in fact, germane to this um, subject. Ah, uh, ah, 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 ah. How about cash and carry? Uh, ah, ah. Oh. I think you're taking this too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim and Willie, after that laborious effort, uh, it's your turn, and once again, the audience will be shown your subject on the board. And Tim and Willie are swallows and Amazons. Swallows and Amazons. <laughs> Slightly dirty. Racy? Mm. Slight risque. 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 And I shall yeah. be in intrigued to see who takes which part in this one. Um, <laughs> oh! You... A clue? A clue? Uh -huh. awesome. Will you define yourselves, please? Animal. Yes, yeah, that'll do. Animal. <laughs> Animals would help you further. Um, yes, to help me more. Um, I'm animals. Um, with one missing. <laughs> with one what missing? With one... Are they human animals? One is. 
One day. I am. I'm not. I'm not. You're getting warm, Tim and Willie. <laughs> but it's Barry and Graham who are doing the guess. Will you would you like to ask them some more questions? Uh, right, animals. You better give them a clue. Uh, yeah. Willie flies a bit, and uh, it's also an action. And you've got one missing. Cock and ball. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm, sort of, I'm, I think I'm, we're given I'm, the same kind of clue that I gave you. They both start with different letters. Ah, <laughs> oh, oh, now oh, narrowing it down. Right now. Open. Oh, that's a bit of a giveaway, that. Um, uh, I don't know, groups of animals. Groups it, of animals. Is, is the word for the group of animals a, um, a word like herd or flock, or is it the name of the animals involved? A silly question. <laughs> They're beautifully put. It's just, uh, just animals. I mean, there they are. It's Birds and bees. That sort of thing. It's like... No, no, no. no. Uh, ah. Yeah, that's very surprisingly close when you hear the answer. Birds and bees, yes. Do mine whistle? <laughs> I can't remember. Golf. <laughs> I don't know, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a tune and let's Swallows and Amazons. Swallows and Amazons. Oh. I'll we go that. on to the blues rap, and as this is the last programme in the series, I'm going to introduce uh, an additional rule here, and that is that I shall deduct 100 marks for <laughs> any of the teams who start their blues with the words, woke up this morning. <laughs> Barry and Graham, will you give Willie and Tim yeah. a, a subject for their blues, please? Yes, we'd like to hear the inflation blues, please. I was worrying about inflation. Then I packed three suitcases and headed off to the bus station. My wife cried. I've got three suitcases stuffed with ten pound notes and I'm going down the supermarket to buy a small tin of carnation. <laughs> Eighteen and a half bar blues. Historic. To give you it's a minute or two to regain your composure and then if you'll give Barry and Graham a subject for their blues, please. The nudist camp blues. <laughs> blues talk. <laughs> I went to sleep last night. Yeah, <laughs> dreaming about a nudist camp where I had been. Of course, where you I had been. Yeah, man. Well, yeah. You know, I saw things there that I never have seen. Yeah, I tell you what about it, baby. The chef got danger money <laughs> for frying sausages. You know what I mean. <laughs> Well, <laughs> we'll all be waiting now to hear what the score is, and I took the precaution just before we went on the air to jot down that Tim and Willie have scored 83, <laughs> Harry and Graham have scored 74. Right, we come now to the round which is called Bedtime Story. For this round, I want one of the members of a team to make up a bedtime story, and from time to time he'll give his partner a signal for a suitable sound effect to reinforce the dramatic effect of the narrative. For extra excitement, the person doing the effects will be wearing headphones with music playing to prevent him from hearing the story. And we have a table, a table with sound effects right out here by the central microphone. And William and Tim, who's going to tell the story and who's going to do the sound effects? 
Uh, I'm going to do sound effects. This is Tim's. That leaves me telling the story. <laughs> so, with Tim to do the sound effects, Willie Rushton, will you tell a story about a dragon, a wooden leg, and a circular saw? <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> one fine day. Well, not that fine, but that's not. <laughs> raining wooden legs. <laughs> and Arnold, the friendly dragon, was sitting outside his cave, <laughs> doing something naughty. <laughs> All he wanted in life was a circular saw. The circular saw was a prize <laughs> in a wonderful contest which the dragon was going to enter. You were to be fired from a cannon over Lord Goodman. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you can hear, he made it. <laughs> Admittedly, he fell on a Swiss gnome and broke a leg. <laughs> one <laughs> with a built-in ejection seat <laughs> but there he sat with his nasty habit his wooden leg and his circular saw outside his cave and every night he used to Never mind, Tim, we'll tell you about it afterwards. <laughs> now, uh, Graham is coming out to do the sound effects for the other team, which leaves Barry behind to tell the story. Graham, will you put it on the headphones, please? Barry, will you tell a story about a little girl, a big boy, and a balloon? <laughs> You've been reading my mail again. Now, <laughs> there was once a little girl called Charity. Charity Biggins was her full name. And she used to like... <laughs> there if you look for the missus. She used to like playing with her balloon in the street. <laughs> Down at the other end of the street, in number 47, remember this, I'll be asking questions later, number 47 lived a little boy called Ronald. And Charity used to love to play with Ronald. They used to... <laughs> play at adjudicating football matches. <laughs> Charity wasn't like other girls. She'd always wanted to be a football referee and Ronald being desperately in love with her had always encouraged this ambition. Charity, he used to say, you may become a football association referee and you'll know the joy of being abused and spat upon and <laughs> when you come out of grounds, people will go... <laughs> but you won't. <laughs> <laughs> then one day may dawn the day of the cup final charity and they'll call it the... <laughs> F.A. Charity Cup, after you, and you'll walk out on that pitch, and oh, the roar when that first goal is scored, but then maybe the first offence, and you'll have to say to one of the players, <laughs> which is, of course, contained in the new F.A. rule book, and furthermore, if there's any more of that, you will go off the field into the dressing room, and... <laughs> Swallow your pride. <laughs> and may only get a three-match suspension. Otherwise, otherwise, unless you've run out of sound effects, you naughty player, you may finish up as a... <laughs> father of a large family. <laughs> Thank you, Barry and Graham. We go on to the round, which is, uh, it says here, a musical round, and it's called Opera, and I want you teams in order to sing a snatch of grand opera from a selected passage. 
from a couple of well-known, probably not so well-known, publications. Who wants to go first? As is they the do. last president, you can choose. I can feel it. Tim and Willie, you <laughs> want to go first. Bianca Bianco visitor. is going to provide the operatic introductions to Tim and Willie singing from uh, the uh, book called Yoga for Health. <laughs> <laughs> In the lotus or cross-legged position, rest hands on knees, on knees, or on floor behind, behind. To use abdominal muscles to contract abdomen as far as possible and hold. For a second. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Three. Attempt to snap a dome in out in a forceful movement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> snap. No. Oh. Oh. Repeat. Without pause. Without pause. Repeat. Without pause. Repeat. Without pause. Repeat. Without pause. Repeat. Without pause. Perform oh. ten times. Ten times. <laughs> In groups of ten. Repeating groups of ten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Tim and Willie. Now, Graham and Barry, your libretto is from The Highway Cut. <laughs> When indicators or stoplights are not fitted or are faulty. <laughs> also for use by pedal cyclists and those in charge of horses. I want to go straight on. I want to turn left. I want to turn right. I want to turn left. I want to turn right. Turn left. Turn right. Turn left. Turn right. Left. Right. Left. Right. Left. Right. Left. Right. Left. Right. Left. Right. Give me some man who was out. Well, this is the time in the programme when I tiptoe away to the computer room at the BBC to work out the final score for the entire series. Meanwhile, the teams will give us their announcements for the late arrivals at the pharmacist's ball. <laughs> Who's going to start? From Wales, Mr and Mrs Tement and their son, Owen Tement. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, please, the distinguished Irish actor, T.C.P. McKenna. <laughs> The ovaire forms with a hideously bound child in terror ovaire forms. <laughs> <laughs> Will you welcome, please, Mr. and Mrs. Ta and their mama Ta. <laughs> Sorry you had to leave so soon. <laughs> All the way from Arabia, shake well before using. <laughs> Welcome, please, Mr. and Mrs. Royds and their daughter, Emma. <laughs> a warm hand and a brown paper bag, please. Here is science. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Tick. And their daughter, Emma Tick. <laughs> oh, that makes you sick. Well, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we come rapidly to the rescue. 
of the teams. I've been working out the final scores for the series. Cabaret time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if I can get away with it. <laughs> Will you welcome, please, Prin the Dissolving Donkey. <laughs> Soluble ass print. Yes! <laughs> Meanwhile, ladies and gentlemen, there are some people who are waiting to hear the final score. <laughs> and I think it'll surprise you. It's 12,864 to the ladies, three to the gentlemen. <laughs> And we shall be back with you again if you don't watch out. So until then, from the teams and myself, goodbye. William Rushton, Graham Garden, Barry Cryer and Tim Brooke Taylor were being given silly things to do by Humphrey Littleton, with Leon Cohen setting some of them to music. Production was by John Castles. Mm -hmm.